to introduce our speaker this afternoon uh, at the AGM of the Friends of St. David's Cathedral, September the 12th, 2020. Professor Norman Doe. Professor Norman is from the Ronda. He uh, teaches at Cardiff University, where he's also the director of its Centre for Law and Religion, running the master's uh, course in canon law, which I know uh, he puts a, a lot of clergy uh, through a good grilling on that. He's been doing that since 1991. He has degrees from Cardiff, from Cambridge and Oxford, and has written multiple books in the fields of both law and religion and the intersection thereof. He's been a, a visiting professor in Paris, a visiting fellow at three Oxford colleges, and indeed president of the European Consortium for Church and State Research. He's been a, con a consultant to the primates, that's the archbishops of the Anglican Communion on canon law, and served on the Lambeth Commission of 2003-04. He has been a, a visiting fellow in Cambridge and a, a fellow of the Learned Society of Wales, and amongst other things is also a barrister and the Chancellor of the Diocese of Bangor. We have him to speak here from time to time because he's very interested in the contents of the, the Cathedral's historic library. And so uh, a, a taster that in Libraries Week this coming October, uh, we're hoping to post a, a sort of a lecturette or something like that uh, about one of our oldest books, uh, which actually is about canon law from before and after the Reformation and how it still applies to us today. But this afternoon, uh, his topic is Liberals, Loggerheads and Law, Welsh Church Disestablishment Remembered. We had very much hoped to have Norman with us in April this year for a launch of a book, A New History of the Church in Wales, reflecting on the century since disestablishment, which he actually brought together, compiled and edited. Uh, that launch obviously fell foul of coronavirus. So we're delighted to have you back today, Norman, to cover Pleasure. some of that ground, but actually the things, not just everybody else's chapters, but the things that delight you most about the church in Pleasure. Wales over the last hundred years. So, Professor Norman Doe. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Do I need to put this on too? There we are. Well, I hope it's worth the wait. There is a certain timelessness about St. David's Cathedral, and we're well now into the second century, uh, so here we go. Um, now, from the 16th century, as we all know, and I'm going to say lots of things that you all know in any event this afternoon, from the 16th century, the Church of England was the established church here in Wales. Yep, the, the state religion, established by a series of parliamentary statutes, uh, with the head being, in law, the king. In England, it still is the established church, but on the 31st of March 1920, it ceased to be the established church in Wales. Intriguingly, the last day of March was also the day on which Owain Glyndwr wrote a letter at Penal in the next-door diocese, uh, to Charles V of France in 1406, proposing independence from, for the Welsh Church from Canterbury. The enactment by Parliament of the Welsh Church Act 1914, leading to disestablishment, occurred in most extraordinary and uh, controversial of political circumstances. So, a hundred years on, here we are, and it's timely in this timeless place to remember this and to reflect on the foundation fortunes and future of the church in Wales. And this Cathedral of St. David's, of course, the mother church, or as they used to say in the 18th century, the parish church of this diocese, has also played a major part in all this. Now, I want to speak for about 30, 35 minutes. I hope that's okay. And uh, there are four themes that I want to pursue. And the first is a potted history of the English church in Wales up until the uh, disestablishment. Can you bear four themes? Yes. Only about 10 minutes, so don't worry about it. It'll be fine now. Some generalities. Uh, 
As we know, the antecedents of the modern church in Wales stretch back a long way, active from the time of the so-called Celtic Church and the Age of the Saints. Welsh Christianity, as we all know, predates English Christianity and Augustine's Canterbury Mission in 597. Important point. In the Middle Ages, however, the four Welsh dioceses, what are they? St. David's, Bangor, Landaf, and St. Asaph. The old Welsh diocese were absorbed into the province um, of Canterbury. And increasingly, as a matter of fact, political and legal fact, uh, under the control and thumb, some would say, of Rome. The church was regulated by papal canon law. Doesn't it sound a sinister thing? Papal canon law. The jus commune of the Western uh, church. Alongside this was the native law of the Roman Church in England and Wales, made by provincial synods, by archbishops, and by papal legates, the so-called legatine constitutions. And these laws touched, imagine, you're in the medieval period, you're in the 15th century. These laws touched all your lives. Not only did they touch the governance of the church and ministry, but lay people's discipline and morals, your wills, your contracts, your trusts, your marriages. It was all governed by canon law. And it was enforced too. It was enforced in the courts of the church. There were archdeacons' courts. You used to have a court. Gone. <laughs> there were bishops' courts. You used to have a court. Still exists and so on, up the hierarchy to an appeal court in Rome. And all this was administered by a professional class of canon lawyers, educated at the canon law faculties in Oxford and Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> and they were trained in the delicate business of studying canon law. You may think it's boring, it's wonderful stuff, living as it does on the edge of theology and civil law and political intrigue in the church and pastoral need and all these other wonderful theological values. Now, one of the most celebrated of these lawyers, medieval lawyers, became the Bishop of St. David's. Bishop Wynne's predecessor, William Lindwood. Hands up. Who's heard of William Lindwood? Oh, my gosh. That's, that's, that's outrageous. It's terrible. Now, his treatise, Provinciale, written in 1433, was and is today the principal authority on canon law in medieval England and Wales, as the Dean has said. And there is, as the Dean has said, uh, I remember I was here 20 years ago giving the Friends lecture, <laughs> and it was a glorious sunny day in the summer, and the, you'd all had lunch, and the sun was streaming in, I was in the pulpit. People were falling off to sleep like Billy Ho. But the dean, as he then was, courageous, stoic, robust, was attentive as ever. Now, uh, in the library, Lindwood's Provinciale, 1505, imagine that. Harry Tidder, born down the road in Pembroke Castle, what did he do? He took his army through Wales, he invaded England, he conquered England, he appropriated Richard III's crown, he set up the Tudor dynasty. His wife, in 1505, set up Christ College in Cambridge, the very year that this thing in the cathedral was uh, published. It's extraordinary stuff. But along comes the Reformation. In the 1530s, and that ends papal authority and opens the way for the establishment of a national church of England under the royal supremacy consolidated in the reign of Elizabeth. It was in her reign that another jurist with Pembrokeshire connections, Richard Hooker, the so-called father of Anglicanism, wrote his laws of ecclesiastical polity with its theology of law. And his father, father Roger Vowell, alias Hooker, who married Alice Hooker from Hampshire when he moved down to Exeter, their family was descended from Iago, son of Gevaf, Vowell of Pembroke. Now, who knew that Hooker was from Pembrokeshire? 
Every day is the school day, isn't it? Wonderful. Now, in uh, the new established church by parliamentary statute, Roman canon law amazingly continue to apply unless contrary to the law of the realm. The canons of 1603, which were operative in the Church of England actually until the 1960s, unbelievable. The Church of England didn't revise its law for 300 plus years. Uh, extraordinary. Um, these were promulgated by the uh, uh, Convocation of Canterbury in 1603, and the Welsh bishops and clergy were, of course, present. And these canons, with any surviving Roman canon law, um, because that survived by statute, uh, to fill the vacuum, if you like, left by withdrawal from the European Church Union under this parliamentary statute, that all formed the ecclesiastical law of the Church of England applicable there and here in Wales. All of these were the sources of law operative in this cathedral until, the 19, until 1920. Now, as in Mary's reign in the 1550s, the English Church was disestablished in the Commonwealth, the Republic, but re-established at the Restoration in 1660. This heralded new laws, tolerating dissenters, as they were called, unable to conform to the established church. But by the 18th century, parted history, I said it was, parted history it is, by the 18th century, the English church in Wales was on the back foot. Absentee bishops. The Bishop of St. David's was deposed in 1700, by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Still the authority in English ecclesiastical law on how to get rid of a bishop. There were non-resident clergy, dilapidated buildings. This cathedral was amongst them in the 18th century. Yet the following decade saw a revival of Christianity and fair play, Anglicans played their part in this. And the spread of dissenting denominations eventually leading in the industrial Victorian age to agitation. I love that word. Everyone from the Rhondda loves that word. <laughs> Agitation um, to disestablish this Church of England in Wales. The Wales and England were, of course, united constitutionally in the 16th century. Assertions of national identity gathered apace in the 19th. Religion was the test case. Welsh nonconformists were the driving force behind the Sunday Closing Wales Act. 1881. Do you know this one? It's wonderful. The first modern Wales-only legislation, which aimed to reduce the effects, of course, of alcohol consumption on workforces and families. And the confidence, this lobbying, this agitation, this political activism uh, instilled, fueled another largely non-conformist national campaign to disestablish the English church in Wales. There had been discontent for years. The Anti-State Church Association set up in England to disestablish the church in England in 1844 gave very little thought to Welsh disestablishment. In Wales, the nonconformists outnumbered Anglicans. They refused to pay church tithes. They believed the minority English church was an alien force anglicising Welsh life. The 1847 report on education portraying the Welsh as backward, barbaric and bone idle certainly did not help the treason of the Blue Books. The Liberal Party supported nonconformity. It had a strong nonconformist following. It advocated religious freedom and equality, that's for its, the heritage of its Whiggish roots in the early 18th, late uh, uh, 17th century. And it advocated separation of church and state. Key point, key point, key point. And Gladstone, of course, we mustn't forget, and his liberal band had disestablished the Church of Ireland. Well, actually, it wasn't a disestablishment in 1869 in Ireland. It was a dissolution of a constitutional union between the established Church of England and the Church of Ireland. But we know it as the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland. Irish disestablishment, the model for some, like the Vicar of Maidrim, um, for the uh, Welsh scheme as it was to develop. So, Liberals liked disestablishment. By way of contrast... The throne and altar conservative party defended establishment and its unionism opposed Wales only legislation on law, on, on, Wales only law on religion. 
Indeed, as the 19th century closed, new legislation ensured that the English Church in Wales no longer monopolised universities, controlled education, or imposed church rates. Gone. While the call to disestablish waned in England, it waxed in Wales, especially after the Welsh Revival, 1905, uh, which increased dramatically numbers of nonconformists in Wales. The swell grows. So, theme two, the legislative battle. Because often, why not use it? I'll be unpopular for saying so. But the law, the constitution of this Friends Association, we've seen it in the AGM. It's a site of development, of debate, of argument. That's what law is. It is a site, a battleground of political, theological, and all sorts of pragmatic uh, blah, 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 things. <laughs> so, legislative battle, the Welsh Church Act and the Church Constitution. The tide for disestablishment seemed unstoppable, but it rolled in slowly. It took 50 years. In 1870, Watkin Williams, a Welsh barrister, Liberal MP, and son of an Anglican cleric, proposed the first bill. It failed. In 1887, disestablishment became official Liberal Party policy, and Gladstone was later publicly to support it, but initially cautious. But after election success in 1892, the Liberals were reluctant to proceed. This led four Welsh MPs, including, guess who? David Lloyd George to refuse the party whip, and further bills came in 1894 and 1895, when, incidentally, my grammar school in the Rhondda was established, the Rhondda County Grammar School. I just thought I'd slip that one in. <laughs> These bills, too, failed. The House of Lords opposed them, and the Liberals lost the 1895 election. However, a landslide Liberal victory in 1906 led to a royal commission, which eventually reported in 1910. It was a delaying tactic. The report was heavily criticised, and its proposals were not unanimous. But it was quite clear about numbers in Wales, 549,000 non-conformist communicants and 193,000 Anglican. John Owen, Bishop of St. David's, whose tomb, uh, whose m m m monument, we've seen this afternoon. He opposed this establishment and he responded to the nonconformist punch, if you like. The church was the strongest religious body in Wales. Anglicans outnumbered the two largest nonconformist bodies combined and all nonconformists were less than half the population and the church looked after the other half, he said. So the protagonists were at loggerheads. There was another bill in 1909 with Lloyd George's People's Budget. The House of Lords rejected that one too. Can you imagine this? It's unbelievable. Bills going from the Commons to the Lords and the Commons saying no, 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 time and time again. So what did the Commons do? They thought of passing the Parliament Act 1911. If you're a constitutional lawyer, you know all about that. So that was passed to enable the Commons to submit a bill for royal assent without the consent of the House of Lords. A constitutional landmark. It was used a couple of years ago with the hunting bill, controversially. Um, <clears throat> so, they passed the Parliament Act. Another bill of 1912 was rejected twice by the House of Lords. So the Commons invoked this new Parliament Act, the first time ever, and the Welsh Church Act 1914 was passed. Its implementation was delayed until after the war, and so the Church of England in Wales and Monmouthshire was disestablished on the 31st of March 1920. Now, the Welsh Church Act 1914 was made to terminate the establishment. They are the words, to terminate the establishment. Remember the Daleks? This is all about terminating the establishment. It's chilling. It's absolutely chilling. It separated church from state. No more royal supremacy or appointments in Wales. Church corporations were dissolved. No more Welsh bishops in the House of Lords. Welsh clergy could be elected to the House of Commons. It also disendowed. English church property was nationalised, transferred to Welsh church commissioners to redistribute. 
churches and parsonages vested in the new church's representative body. Churchyards were transferred to local authorities. I bet not many of you knew that. Churchyards were transferred to local authorities and other property to the University of Wales and the National Library of Wales. The Act provided that English ecclesiastical law ceased to exist as law of the land in Wales. But its pre-1920 norms of English ecclesiastical law continued to apply to the church in Wales as if a fiction, as if its members had assented to them as terms of a statutory contract filling a legal vacuum by disestablishment. So the members of the church in Wales, hands up who's a member of the church in Wales. Yes, a quarter. Well, you were in law, you were all bound by what they call a consensual compact. You're parties to a contract. You're parties to a contract. Now, theologize about that. It's a fascinating one, isn't it? How do you produce a theology of the reality that the law, see, our law too, the church's law, sees us as related by contract? So, <clears throat> the Act also, of course, gave self-government. The church could hold synods, frame a constitution, repeal or amend pre-1920 English ecclesiastical acts of parliament. The governing body can repeal acts of parliament. This is extraordinary. Why? Because they're no longer the law of the land. They're terms of a contract. They've been privatized. And so we can do that because parliament gave us the power to change acts of parliament, the so-called disestablished church in Wales. Now, many Welsh Anglicans, like Tractarian cleric Robert Owen, who favored disestablishment, had for years pitied the English church as an act of parliament church because its foundation uh, and, uh, it, it was the result of state act of parliament activity and it was subjected to the state uh, in its exercise of power through acts of parliament. It was an act of parliament church. That wasn't nice for him. Indeed, parliament made on average 25 statutes, acts of parliament each year on the Church of England in the 19th century. Can you imagine that? 25. Imagine the Queen's speech. In the, uh, Victoria, get up there. And another bill to revolutionise patronage law. And another bill to get rid of simony. And another bill to deal with pluralities. And another bill to deal with rates. It's extraordinary. So, lots of law applied to the Church of England. Now, the 1914 Welsh Church Act liberated the Welsh Church from all that. It liberated the church from the state. In 1920, the Archbishop of Canterbury released the four Welsh dioceses from that province. They formed then a new autonomous province of the global Anglican communion. So the church provincialized itself and the state privatized the church as a voluntary association like any other free church in Wales. But state courts actually struggled to classify the church. One judge, for example, spoke of the disestablishment of the church in Wales. That was 1944. Another judge said the 1914 Act did not disestablish the church, but only disestablished the Church of England in Wales. That was 1951. And a third judge said the object of the Welsh Church Act was to re-establish the church in Wales on a contractual basis. And some today, and I think there's one here, who thinks the church in Wales is a quasi-established church. It's not a disestablished church. That one left in 1920. At best, it's a non-established church. It's a free church, like the Methodists or like Baptist, local Baptist churches. I checked away the wrong sheet there. <laughs> Getting overexcited. Now... Cardiff, 1917, chilly, cold, big photograph. There's a convention of Anglicans in Wales, uh, in Cardiff in 1914. And their job is to talk about the future of the church. Do we have a constitution? If yes, what's it look like? What theology is to underlie it? How do we organize it? Who's going to write it? John Sankey. My wife, Heather, she is so supportive. She listens to this every day. Could you imagine it? I mean, she's a doctor, she's sensible. I'm a lawyer, I'm not. Anyway, uh, our parish in Roth in Cardiff, the parish church, <laughs> we're in a daughter church. 
the parish of Roth, John Sankey was brought up there, and he did all the spade work drafting the Constitution. Look, I'm way behind the time here. What's the, what is the time? I don't want to keep you if you've got to go to tea, isn't it? Oh, you're all right. Um, no, I don't know. No, I, I don't know. Oh. Well, it just goes on. It's 100 years. How can you get 100 years in 10 minutes? I mean, it's very difficult. Right, so this convention, John Sankey, he starts drafting the Constitution. Right, extraordinary fellow. Jesus College, Oxford win. When I was a visiting fellow there, I sat there at breakfast, and my beans and my egg, and who was looking down on high table? John Sankey. Extraordinary man. Absolutely extraordinary man. My goodness. Um, he was uh, an anti-disestablishmentarian, if I may say that. <laughs> um, but he was a realist. Um, high Court judge, chair of the Enemy Aliens Committee, chair of a coal industry commission favouring nationalisation. What a man. Sankey became Lord Chancellor, actually a Labour Lord Chancellor, uh, in 1928. And as his diaries attest, that's a good word, as his diaries attest in the Bodleian, he worked tirelessly on this constitution. At the 1917 convention, he was positive. He said, uh, there is, these are his words, we have the privilege, seldom given to a generation, of shaping the course of the church. It may be for centuries. He consulted, these are his words, every constitution of every disestablished church. Legal error there. Church, uh, Anglican churches around the world, very few of them have ever been established. Um, but anyway, he looked at the constitution of all Anglican churches. Amazing! What donkey work! But he drafted only, he said, what was absolutely essential. No originality. Sankey's efforts were appreciated. A woman in St. David's diocese, I'm trying to get St. David's in, as you've appreciated, practically every page of this talk. A woman in St. David's diocese at Llandevery, as a matter of fact, wrote, is that in this diocese? Llandevery? Yes. Wrote to him, these are his words, I read them in his diary, letters in his diary in the Bodleian, we in Wales owe you a great debt, she said, this lady, for your powerful aid and wise counsel during the crisis in the history of our beloved church and for your strong hand in drafting its new constitution. Actually, in the portrait of Jesus College, his hands look quite effeminate, actually, uh, with a little red handkerchief in one of them. But anyway, not to worry. By 1936, uh, in a letter about publishing his reminiscences, Sankey himself wrote that when I drew up the constitution of the church in Wales, this was number five of the top ten points of my career. Is that, what a man been Lord Chancellor. He'd done the lot. Another son of St. David's diocese, C.A.H. Green, was the first to think theologically about the Constitution. He echoes Sankey's conservatism. Green's book, with a snappy title, The Setting of the Constitution of the Church in Wales, 1937, written when he was Archbishop of Wales, was a high church view of law. The 1914 Act, he said, secured the spiritual liberty of the church in Wales. Boomf, that's the state. But the constitution of the church limited the use of that liberty, protecting the church's Catholicity and its episcopal order and character. Boomf. We've moved on from Green's view of the nature of law in the church, but that was an early view bred, if you like, by somebody in this diocese. The original structure of the Constitution actually continues to this day. Revision over the century has been piecemeal. Unlike most Anglican churches, the church still has no modern code of canons, for example. And we still await a modern statement of the pre-1920 continuing English ecclesiastical law. We still haven't worked out which bits of that apply to us, and we are endlessly arguing about it. Uh, and wasting time, money, and effort. Um, so, in, 19, in 2012, um, the, uh, what's it called, the um, Harris Commission report, review, uh, said that uh, the Constitution is outdated, it's far too complex, nobody understands it, it's a mess, change it. Well, here we are, eight years later, nothing's happened. Uh, and that is the way. Now, third little theme, uh, can somebody remind you, what time did I start? Five, what did you say? 
Five past two, I've already, already been going on. I've done 35 minutes. Well, I'm not going to bother with uh, the other two parts of this. I hope I have given you a flavour. Uh, I said 35 minutes, so 35 minutes is going to be uh, too many digressions. I digress. I must I get back to um, So, uh, I'm not going to bother with all that. Anyway, if you want to read it, read, get the book. I mean, it's all in... Well, actually, all that I've told you now is not in the book, strangely. Um, but uh, I shall finish with this. So... What I would have dealt with, and it's not a deeply uplifting uh, business, I would have, uh, there were the third section, right, was technical. It was on the so-called vestiges of establishment. Even though the Church of England in Wales was disestablished in 1920, certain features of its relationship with the state continued, like the duty to bury people, like the duty to marry people, like the duty to provide chaplains in Her Majesty's prisons like the ecclesiastical exemption under which you have to get faculties and wait for months and months and months before they're issued by the Dalston courts, unless you're in the Diocese of Bangor, that is, where, where it's slightly quicker. Anyway, oh, boy, I should have said, you can edit that, Chris. Anyway, um, so, uh, so, I would have told you, these are fascinating things. The transfer of the church yards to local authorities didn't work. Uh, and when they were transferred, the local authorities, the law said, well, you, you, still, you, uh, you can walk over the thing, you still can bury and, and so on. But it didn't work because of maintenance problems, and so they came back. But the deal was, it was a political deal. You can have your church house back if you bury anyone who's resident in the parish. It was just a, a political quid pro quo. It wasn't anything to do with any value inherent in the former establishment. So we, though we call it a vestige of establishment, it was just a political deal. Marriage is another fascinating one, especially with the same-sex marriage law that's just been enacted uh, by Parliament and the exemptions Wales has under that. And, and, the, and the prejudice uh, that Westminster showed in drafting the bill uh, in 2012 on same-sex marriages and said, oh, if Wales wants to opt into this, the church in Wales, that is, you've got to go begging to the Lord Chancellor. And you've got to ask the Lord Chancellor to allow you to solemnise the marriages of people with same, in same-sex unions. Uh, the, the bill gave a discretion to the Lord Chancellor. And the Church in Wales rightly was, was annoyed. Where's religious freedom gone? If we decide something on this matter, it so happens historically the business is in the keeping of the state, and you do as we say. And fair play in the Act, the Act was changed, there were meetings down the, uh, what was the Assembly, now the Parliament, and the Act was changed so that the Lord Chancellor must, is under a duty, no messing between with discretion, is under a duty, a preceptive duty, to do what the Church in Wales, if it decides to go down the road of solemnising same-sex marriages. Uh, fascinating things with Lord Atkin in the 30s of Abu Dhabi, big rows over whether the church clergy can solemnise the marriages of divorced persons whose former spouses are still living. And Atkin, who was a Court of Appeal judge in the 30s, introduced the divorce bill in the House of Lords and got a conscience clause for clergy. But then the Welsh bishops, I said, oh, blanket prohibition against solemnising marriages of divorced persons. No, no cleric in Wales can do it. Atkin was outraged. Absolutely outraged. You can't do that. The law of the state gives a discretion to individual clergy to decide as a matter of conscience if they wish to marry uh, divorced persons. The bishops can't fetter that statutory right by some blanket prohibition. Bishops tried to get away with murder. <laughs> and it wasn't until 1998 that that policy, that rule of the bishops was changed after again the law was a site of argument and nastiness, bitterness in governing body. So, the past hundred years are but one part of a much longer history of Welsh Christianity. And there have been major successes in education, in interface with society, in development of liturgical freedom, in, uh, in doctrinal, um, well, <laughs> freedom basically, um, in, in, in the numbers uh, uh, of, of people who are members of the church, in the, the, the terms of ordained ministry, professional development, uh, non-stipendary ministry. There have been hundreds of changes. Read the book. 
Now, the, the Victorian Liberal Party, the political and religious loggerheads which culminated in disestablishment, and the law as the site of these battles provide the backdrop to a century of both continuity and change in the Church in Wales, in all these areas. And it is right, I think, or let's phrase it again, it is right, comma, perhaps, comma, that the last word should go to the bishop whose seat is here in this wonderful cathedral, the current incumbent, Bishop Joanna, because she's rec recently written that, and I'll end with a quote, the church in Wales marks its centenary in 2020, but the heritage of the diocese which it comprises stretches back considerably further. And while today the church does not have quite the place in society it had a disestablishment, we can put in parenthesis there, uh, Tory and Toff. Through its work at the diocesan and parish levels, it continues to exercise the responsibility to serve the people and communities of Wales to which it feels called. End of quotation. One valued vehicle for this is, of course, the Friends of St. David's Cathedral. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, maybe not. <laughs>